guess what, Tomato? What? What is it? You're a vegetable again! You, you really mean it? Yeah! They just announced it on the news! You're not a fruit anymore! <gasps> that's, that's... Oh my god, I'm a vegetable again! I knew this would happen! This is the greatest day of my life! Hey! Hey, Tomato! Yes, Orange? April Fools, you're still a fruit! <laughs> you, you jerk! Welcome, ProStart Culinarians. This is Chef Hawks with you. We are now on Chapter 5. We are looking at fruit. Let's jump in. On a botanical level, the fruit is the seed-bearing ovary of a flowering plant. It can be added to desserts, soups, salads, main courses, or just eaten by itself. It gives us many different colors, all sorts of different varieties and flavors that we can use in the culinary world. It adds a sweetness, and that comes from the fructose, which is the natural sugar that we get in fruit, right? Fruit, fructose, should be fairly easy to remember. There are three main groups of fruit. We look at summer, winter, and tropical, or exotic. And we have lots of different forms of fruit. So it comes as fresh, whole, or cut, frozen, canned, or dried. So let's take a look first at our summer fruits. So this is, these are the fruits which ripen in the summer, depending on the climate that they're specifically growing in. We can eat them raw, baked, or cooked. And this, so this includes berries, cherries, grapes, melons, peaches, nectarines, plums, and pears. So notice right in the middle there, those peaches, nectarines, plums, these are part of the droops fruit. These are the ones that instead of having individual small seeds inside, they have a central pit or a stone inside. So those are the cherries, plums, peaches, nectarines, and apricots are all droops. Let's take a look at some of these. So apricots, so these kind of resemble peaches. They're on the smaller side, um, and they have a dry flesh with a fuzzy skin, nice and sweet. Berries, so these grow, ripen, uh, and on vines and shrubs, they're very, very fragile, and they perish very easily. They can mold very quickly. They have a very high fruit, uh, very high water content to them. So these are grown in most soils and regions around the world, and they are very easy and quick to be able to prepare into all sorts of different dishes. They should be nice and plump and free of mold. When we're, when we're taking them into our kitchen. Any signs of any mold or shriveling, we don't want to accept them at all. We always wash them right before we're gonna use them. And we'll talk more about this as we go through, but to avoid any of the problems we get with things like mold um, and, and disintegration, we only wash them right before we're about to use them uh, with minimalized handling. handling. Cherries. Cherries are grown on trees in temperate climates. So they can vary from very, very tart, sharp cherries all the way through to very, very sweet cherries. We use them in baking, cooking, and all sorts of preserves too. Grapes grow in nutrient-rich soil. They grow in clusters on vines. Some have seeds, some have no seeds. They generally ripen up around the uh, late summer to early fall time, and the skin is actually what contains the flavor and the color. The flesh itself is mostly sugar, but the skin um, has all of, the, uh, all of the necessary things for the flavor and all the color in there as well. Melons are divided into two main groups. We have sweet melons and watermelons. So sweet melons include musk melons, which can, they, that also includes cantaloupe and honeydew. So they should have a tan or a yellowish green kind of colored rind, which is, the rind is the outer shell. And so it should have, uh, the flesh should be a nice thick, tight texture to it as well. And then there's a central network of seeds on the inside. We can see that picture right down here. You've got the seeds here and that rind that goes just around the outside to protect um, that flesh. Then we have watermelons. So watermelons are large with watery flesh and smooth green skin on the outside. It's a very uh, very thick white and green rind uh, that surrounds the actual fruit itself to protect it. And it has a crisp pink watery flesh to it. The seeds are distributed all the way through the flesh in watermelon too. 
Nectarines, another droop. They're similar to peaches. They have a smooth skin though, and they have a, a firm flesh to them as well. We always have to avoid blemishes and bruises because nectarines are very susceptible to them where the, where the fruit can actually start to degrade very quickly. Peaches, so peaches have a fuzzy skin to them. They're very sweet. We have two different types. We have freestone and clingstone. And the name kind of plays into why they're named that way. So the uh, freestone are the ones where the actual flesh of the fruit can actually pull away from the stone relatively easily. The cling stones are the ones where we literally just have to cut the flesh off right around the actual fruit, uh, right around the stone itself, because they don't like to, uh, to pull away very easily at all. The flesh can vary in color from white to yellow, to yellow, orange, and even red. And the flavors um, are very, uh, can be fairly strong and very pungent um, in, in their perfumey type of nature as well. Pears. These grow in many regions all over the world. They have a sweet and smooth flesh to them. These are usually harvested and then after that they're ripened. So they do not ripen on the tree itself. It's after they have been uh, picked that the, the fruit will actually start to ripen. Plums, so these can come in many different colors and sizes too. We have two main types of these. We have dessert and cooking. So the dessert, uh, the dessert ones are actually on the sweeter side. Cooking plums are actually fairly sharp, but you can cook those into all sorts of different dishes uh, where you can either use them for savory dishes or you can use them for sweet dishes. But the, uh, the uh, cooking plums are very uh, good because you can actually use those in a variety of different ways and they lend themselves in different ways because of the high acidity. You can add sugar to them um, to bring out the sweetness or you can just leave them as a sharper type of flavor if you're cooking with them and using them on more savory dishes. Both of these types can be eaten raw. Now we're going to take a look at some winter fruits. So apples, this is the most commonly used fruit that we have on earth. So we, uh, this is uh, mostly grown in China and the US in massive quantities but most countries around the world have some form of apple growing. That's why we have over 7,500 uh, 7, different varieties of apples, offering different colors, different textures, different flavors, sweetnesses, and sharpnesses to them. So we can uh, use these for cooking, we can use them for juice, desserts, or we can just eat them raw. The flavor range is enormous, all the way from very sharp tartness all the way to sweetness. Another winter fruit is citrus fruits, as we can see. So we're talking about grapefruits, lemons, limes, oranges, nectarines. It's just a huge array of different products there. So these are grown in over uh, grown in places like southern China, Mediterranean Basin, South Africa, Australia, and southernmost United States uh, on the west coast of the United States, Mexico, and parts of South America as well. They have a thick rind and a segmented flesh. You can actually see directly here, the actual segments right in here as well. And we can use that rind as well. We'll talk more about that later as well. These contain huge amounts of vitamin C, which is great for our immune system. They can uh, range all the way from very sweet, if we're going to have a tangerine, all the way to very tart sharpness uh, from things like lemons and limes and grapefruits. So, uh, and looking at that, we can uh, include these as oranges, grapefruits, lemons, limes, tangerines, and so many more. You should always look to have these fruits that have a smooth skin on the outside and free from large blemishes. Otherwise, those blemishes may carry on inside the fruit to the parts that we're going to enjoy. Now we move on to tropical fruits. So, tropical fruits can include dates, kiwis, mangoes, bananas, papayas, pomegranate, pineapple, guava, star fruit, and passion fruit. Let's look at bananas first. So we pick these before they're ripe. They start to ripen up very quickly when they begin. They contain a fairly large amount of carbohydrate, but also fiber, potassium, vitamins, and minerals as well. These are great for just eating by themselves, um, but they're also great for baking with as well. 
there's a big range in different flavors, um, although very often we see a fairly small range of the number of different bananas that are available in most grocery stores. But they can range from sweet down to mild. And ripeness can influence the sweetness as well as they become more ripe and darkened down. Um, then the sugar level starts to rise in the fruit itself. Green bananas are often used in things like Caribbean recipes, whilst overripe bananas are good for uh, using in banana bread. Then we move on to coconuts. So coconuts have many layers. And so uh, we should always uh, be careful with these because the outer layer uh, that we actually see here is very woody, it's very tough, and so it can be very difficult and kind of uh, tiresome for people to wonder how they can use it. So very often they'll end up just using things like desiccated coconut, which is dried coconut flesh. When the fact is, there's, a, uh, there's an amazing amount of flavor and, uh, and goodness that we can use from the fresh flesh that's in a, in a coconut. All we need to know is how do we get into that thing. So what I like to do is... If you identify those two ends with the holes at one end and the, where the stem comes off, you look at the equator around the other side, and that's where probably that shell is the weakest. And if you hold it in your hand, and now this part is very important, with the knife, not the sharp end, but the dull end, you just simply firmly tap that coconut, and you can rotate it around a little bit in your hand as you kind of whack the coconut, and it'll sound very hard as you go. But you're getting right in that little equator, and that's where the, the coconut probably is the weakest. And you'll start to hear the sound change. Hear that sound? Now it's a little hollow, dull sound as you go around. And you keep kind of rotating it, remembering not to raise the knife too hard, high, and hit yourself with the knife going back. And just keep whacking it. Listen for that sound to change. Hear it again? And now it's going to start to crack. It sounds like a little dud of a drum. see that crack forming. See the crack there along that coconut? Once you see that happening, it's almost like you get in there. You just keep working that crack to make a firm hit, and it'll slowly start to break apart. Now, always be cautious when doing this, because you don't want to miss it. You hit your hand with the back of the knife. So this one's almost broken apart now, and soon the water will start to leak out as you, as you pull it. Crack it a little bit. Well, you might have to give it a couple more wax. As I said, a lot stand between you and a fresh coconut. A couple more hits. This one's pretty close. One, uh, it'll open up. You can even insert the knife along that crack now because it's pretty open. And you'll see the water now drain out as it goes. Sometimes it'll crack right in half. But now we've kind of got it. You see where we have it now. It comes right apart of the two halves. Kiwis are also called Chinese gooseberries. And they have a fuzzy skin, a fuzzy brown skin on the outside, and a green flesh with a really cool star pattern of tiny black seeds on the inside. Really good for uh, using in desserts and garnishes. Mangoes are a medium-sized, thick-skinned fruit. So these have a bright yellow to orange flesh. They have sweet to spicy uh, sweet flavors inside them. They have great color and aroma. Um, really stands out when you put those into fruit salads and things like that. Great for presentations. And so well, they give slightly when you press on the side, and that's when you can tell that, they're f that the fruit is actually ripe and ready for eating. Papayas have a pink-orange flesh uh, with black seeds. They have a sweet, tart flavor and a firm flesh to them as well. They can be eaten raw or cooked um, in slightly sweet or savory dishes as well. Pineapples. So pineapples have a diamond pattern skin and golden flesh, juicy with sweet to sweet tart kinds of flavors depending on how uh, ripe they are. They can be eaten raw or cooked and used in sweet and savory dishes. They have a good aroma and no dried leaves or stem should be seen on them, um, otherwise they may be in the form of deterioration. Hey everyone.
Hi, Chef Fox here again. So today we're going to continue on looking at how we prepare and start cutting down uh, certain fruits and vegetables. Today, as you can see, we're going to work on a pineapple. So from the outwards look of this, it looks very tricky. I mean, there's lots of parts to it. It's kind of spiky. What do we do to make this so that it's a nice edible dish, so that when we're preparing this for customers or guests, that they don't have to worry about any of these parts that are inedible? Um, you know, what, what can we build from it? What can we maximize with that yield as well? What can we do with the rest of it that's not necessarily trash? So let's take a look. So to start off with, we're placing our clean chopping board onto um, with, with a towel underneath it. This will make sure that it's not going to move around. We must immobilize that. We want to slide around, especially when we're dealing with sharp knives um, that could injure ourselves if we're not fully locked in. So let's take a look at the pineapple. So this is a very ripe pineapple that I have here. I purchased this um, more than a week ago. I love my pineapple to be this nice golden kind of color, just so that way I know that it's nice and sweet and tender inside. Um, but so generally when you purchase them, you'll get them when they're pretty green. Um, they'll have a sharper acidity to them. So if you prefer that, then that's fine. Um, and so looking at this, so we have the main body of the fruit itself. This is actually made up of all these separate segments. Pineapple is very unusual in the fact that the way it's formed, each of these segments is an individual flower on the, that the pineapple plant produces. Each one is then pollinated and they fuse together as they start to grow to form one single fruit. Whereas if you have something like a tomato or an apple, there's one single bloom that's created, that one's pollinated and that turns into one single fruit. So pineapple is very unusual in that in that regard. Now, we can look at this where well, we've got this very leathery kind of skin that protects it. Um, now, is that trash? Well, we're going to look at a few things that we can do with that. Uh, but then also we have this whole top piece here. Now, this is in pretty bad shape now just because I've been ripening it for so long. But the fact is, is if you have one where it's a little younger, a few, a few days younger than this, then you can actually use this as part of garnish on different platters that you may produce. But something kind of neat, if you look in the center here, these leaves are still nice and green. That's because this is actually the pineapple plant. And we can actually, uh, we can actually grow this into another pineapple or into another pineapple plant and, and actually grow pineapple from this. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of patience, about two years. Um, but that's something that you could do if you're interested as well. The other thing we can do with all of the trimmings from this, we can put it into our compost, um, which uh, I'll have a video up on that as well, um, that you'll be able to see as well. So you can do a lot of things. There should be no waste to any of this at the end of the day. Okay, so let's get started. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to separate the top plume up here, and we're literally going to take just a very small amount of the flesh as we slice across, we don't want to waste anything more than we have to. Uh, we're just going to take that small part right there. We're going to put that over here for now. And then we're going to cut off the base. Again, doing our best not to cut off too much of the product. And now, as you can see, this is not a flat-sided fruit. It bows out to an extent. And so what we're going to do, we're actually going to cut going across like this. And then we're actually going to go down a little and then we're going to taper back in again at the bottom. So as you can see we start at the start here, we come down and we taper at the bottom. And then after that first cut, now we can do some nice small cuts as we go. Starting off at the top, angling like this at the top. And then going down, tapering it. Just continue going all the way around. until we finish up the entire fruit. Try your best to avoid having too many of these. If there's one or two little bits in there, then it's okay, but they tend to be fibrous. So you want to try and minimize just how much of that you have in there without, without taking off too much fruit. So, so far now we have this broken down uh, to the extent where we can really start seeing the more of the finished product. Now with this skin, this leathery skin, there are actually a lot of enzymes that are in this skin. 
And what we can actually do, we can use this to marinate some tougher cuts of meat to actually start to break them down. The enzymes that are in that skin, um, you can blend, those, blend that skin down, then you can make a rub all over um, you know, maybe a piece of beef or a piece of pork. Um, it will actually start to break down the flesh on there. Just be careful not to have it on there too long because it literally starts to chemically digest and break down that meat. But anyway, so that's a use that we can use uh, for that if we're not going to put it into a compost. So now from here, if we go ahead and cut this in half, we can see the makeup of this pineapple. So this center part right down here, this is the core. It's very fibrous. It's not inedible but uh, it's not something that's going to be comfortable to eat. So we generally will not use this part to, to eat. Um, but these parts fanning on either side, as you can see the kind of uh, the fibers uh, fan out across on the sides. This is the perfect part. This is the sweet, juicy part. So what we're going to do, because this is a round, uh, it's a round core that goes across here, we don't want to uh, remove too much of the actual edible flesh. So what we're going to do is go just to the right of our core and slice it down part way. Then we're going to pull out and then we'll turn it and then we'll go to the other side going in a V shape. So that way we can just lift out that core. We haven't removed too much of the flesh at all. And then that way this will be part of what, uh, what we can use. You can, again, you can grind this up. Um, blend that up and use that uh, to tenderize meats, or you can put it into the compost as well. And now here we can just slice that in half. Now we have some very usable pieces. Um, so now depending upon your presentation that you might want to have, you can slice this. Remember we always use the claw grip when we're slicing. So we can slice down some pieces of pineapple this way. So say if on your, on your presentation, you want to be able to fan this out, and you can make a nice presentation fanning them out. Now, if it's for a fruit cocktail, then you may just want to slice some pieces down like this, and then slice some nice, even little wedges, just like this. Lots of different ways that pineapple can be used. So now we've got all the various different pieces of pineapple and so we can enjoy all of that fruit and um, we can use uh, the core and the skin as we've talked about as well uh, but so now we come to the head of the pineapple so now with this part right here we can literally just twist off to take off that part there and so what we're looking for so remember the the, the remaining plant that will grow actually will come up from the inside it will start to grow more of these more of these pines right here that will actually come out and it'll actually grow significantly taller. So what we're going to do is we need to expose the roots. And this can take a little bit of time. But as you can see, these bottom fronds right here, they literally just peel right off. And we're going to start working our way all the way up the plant. And what we're going to be doing while we do this, we're actually exposing some hidden roots that are inside here. So, as you can see, we can get that focus. Um, you can see right here, these are roots that are actually growing up from this plant itself. So, we're going to work our way up, just continuing to peel these back and exposing those roots, trying not to damage those roots. They're pretty hardy, though. Take a little bit of time, but uh, just keep on going until we get about this far up on the plant. So, as you can see, all the way across here, these are all roots that are all growing up. They're all right now inactive because they've been dry for quite a while. So, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to reactivate them. Let's take a look now at a little bit of storage and also the characteristics of what we look for when we're actually purchasing and having these uh, fruits sent to us by distributors. So the characteristics of freshness in fruits is that they should be good and plump. There shouldn't be bruises, mold, brown or soft spots on them. 
We shouldn't be seeing any pest damage to them either. And the attached leaves should be firm but not wilted. The color and the texture should be appropriate to that fruit or vegetable type. Some vegetables are available all year. Others have limited growing seasons. Um, some of them we may actually be able to get um, from other parts of the world when they're not in season in our area. So um, the, these, the factors in purchasing for us and selecting our fruits can come down to seasonality because if you want to have uh, strawberries in the United States in the middle of January or February, then they're either going to be coming from California, possibly Chile. They're not going to be coming from our back doorstep. That's for sure. It's too cold. And so uh, that can actually raise the prices on what we're paying for and also raise or lower the quality of what we're actually getting in the end because they're picked so young when they're not at all ripe. In general, we're looking for fruit that has good ripeness to it where it's been ripened for as long as possible on the tree or the vine that it came from. The price point can be drastically affected uh, by the seasonality as well. And the recipe requirements uh, might require, uh, say, some fresh strawberries uh, that you're going to cook down into uh, a strawberry cobbler. But if you want to have strawberries that taste good in the middle of January, you might be better off using some frozen strawberries so that you can have strawberries that were picked when they were, when they were ripe and that have lots of flavor to them. But the actual appearance doesn't quite matter so much. It also comes down to the skill level of the employees who are, who are cutting up these fruit items as well. Because if you have uh, employees who don't know how to prepare some of these fruit, then they may end up wasting a lot of it as well. And also the vendor availability as well. Braiding is done by the United States Department of Agriculture. This helps us to actually get a good idea as to what quality will be coming through the door when we're ordering certain products. So the USDA grades from the highest to the lowest in the following way. So we have US Extra Fancy, then US Fancy, US Number 1, Number 2, and Number 3. So US Fancy is usually what we use in food service operations. Fruit that has lower grades can still be used, but we would use it in dishes like baked pies, puddings, jams, jellies, and cobblers, where it doesn't really matter what the appearance looks like, but the safety is always there, and that part is key. When we look at canning fruits, and veg uh, canning fruits, then we look at, from highest to lowest, US grade A, fancy, grade B, choice, and grade C, standard. And so the uh, fancy would have good color, flavor, uniformity in size of pieces. Grade B would be the second best, average color and flavor. And C would be poor quality with imperfections and non-uniform sizes of pieces uh, where they're probably more of the trimmed parts that are in there. But again, we can use these things. They are safe to eat, but we're going to use something like that where the appearance doesn't matter. When we store fruits, it's very important that we care for them to make sure we maximize their lifespan. So ripe fruits can be stored at 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's right around where our refrigerator should be. And so that is except for bananas. We don't want to have those under refrigerated conditions. So we store them separately from vegetables. There's lots of vegetables around, things like garlic and onions that have very strong flavors and smells to them. We don't want the aroma from that to be infecting some of our very mild flavored uh, fruits like melon that may end up taking on some of those flavors and it might end up ruining them. So there are some, in talking about apples, bananas, and melons, that emit ethylene gas when they ripen. We want to store them separately. That ethylene gas is what causes the ripening in fruit and it can actually speed up the ripening in some of our other fruits and make them go bad much quicker. So unless if you're planning on using that ethylene gas that's coming out to ripen some fruits close by, then we need to store them separately. So most fruits need to be kept um, very dry. We don't want to have excess moisture around, which can cause the product to spoil more quickly. And so that's why if you look at your refrigerator at home, you probably have a fruit, um, a fruit drawer in there which actually has a lower humidity level in there. We only ever wash our fruit 
just before we're about to use it so that we don't damage it and also so that we're not adding too much extra moisture to it that can make it go moldy very, very quickly. So we're always very careful of that to maximize the quality of what we have and the shelf life that we have with these fruits. If we're looking to ripen fruits still, then we'd actually have those in a warmer condition, about 65 to 70 degrees, closer to room temperature, so that they will actually ripen a little more, a little faster. We don't want to, um, we don't want to take them to too high of a temperature though, because that can actually, add, um, in the end, change and denature that fruit. When we clean fruits, uh, the first step, and uh, this is the first step in our preparation, we should always make sure that all of our produce is clean before we get started. We want to remove pathogens, chemicals, dirt, animal and pest contamination that could happen, because these things are grown in fields. So we're, go we're going to wash them close to our prep time, as we've already discussed. We're going to use cold water, and you're gentle with them. Um, you, have to, uh, you may have to use a brush to remove residue on things that have heavier rinds, stronger rinds that won't be torn apart. When it, comes to, um, when it comes to removing things like skin, some of them you may actually use a peeler. Um, some of them you may be peeling by hand. Um, some of them uh, you might be using a paring knife, depending on exactly how the skin is and the best way to get off with uh, maximizing the fruit that's left, but always maximizing the quality of what's left as well. Uh, we'd remove the core, so things like apples and pears, they have cores that we would remove. Other, um, other fruits don't have cores. This is where we would remove the seeds by, seeds by scooping them out or cutting them out with a knife. We want to remove those seeds and stones, the pits in the droops. Um, maybe you'd very often cut them in half and scoop out the seeds, um, but you want to try and remove as little flesh with those seeds as possible to maximize what we get from that fruit. Um, some, uh, we, we do have some special pitters for things like cherries. We actually have pitters where they will literally push the pit straight through um, so that we remove them without removing any of the flesh. Um, from there as well. Um, some, some of them you would actually have to cut in half and pull out the pit from the flesh. Things like apricots, nectarines, and peaches. If we're looking to get the zest from a, uh, from a fruit, uh, from citrus fruits, when you look at this orange right here, this is a zester. It's actually pulling off these really nice little ribbons of zest. But there are other ways that we can remove this as well. These are very, this is a very fine grater, and all we do, we put it against the orange and peel just the orange portion off of that orange. And we don't want to get any of the white that's under this orange. That's uh, very bitter. The white part's very bitter. So we do it this way with the, with the microplane, and that's what our zest looks like. This is also a microplane, only this one is just a little coarser, and it does the same thing, only takes it off just a little bit bigger pieces. And again, we're not taking any of the white from underneath. We're taking just the yellow off of the orange. And that is how you zest an orange. We can also uh, cut that peel into thin strips as well. The really important part of all of that is to make sure that we don't have any of the pith the white that's right underneath that zest, uh, because that's very bitter. Um, and so uh, we also want to remove stems from other fruits as well. So hard fruit, we can just twist uh, the stem from the fruit. With soft fruit, you would just pull that out. Uh, some of them do actually have to be cut out as well. When we're cutting fruit, it's really important that we use sharp knives uh, to make good clean cuts. I should remember a sharp knife is a safe knife. Wedges, chunks, slices, and cubes are all popular shapes that we make from fruits. Some fruits can brown after they've been cut. This is called enzymatic browning. This is when we have polyphenol oxidase, which is an enzyme that you find in things like pears and apples, um, tend to make the fruit go brown very, very quickly. Uh, this is actually part of the protective system that that apple or that pear has to protect the seeds inside, because at the end of the day, the point of that fruit is to actually uh, protect and nourish the seed inside to try and make another tree or bush or vine grow. We can prevent this 
by adding an acid. Very often when we use uh, lemon juice um, or a citrus juice of some sort to help uh, stop that browning from happen happening. And then we use alkalis, uh, or bear in mind that alkalis will cause fruit structures to break down. So things like baking soda will actually cause some fruits to break down. You can use this to your benefit if you want to, if you want to uh, do some quick breakdowns on some foods, but it can have a bad reaction if you're looking to hold those fruits as a solid um, for longer. Easy ways to cut a mango. Mangoes are a tropical fruit with thick, green skin with a blush of red shading. Mangoes have one long, flat seed in the center of the fruit. To cut a mango, begin by using a paring knife to slice the bottom stem off. This gives the mango a flat surface to stand upright on the cutting board. Stand the mango on the cutting board, stem end down, and hold it in place. Place your knife about a quarter inch from the widest center line and cut down through the mango. Flip the mango around and repeat this cut on the other side. The resulting ovals are known as cheeks. What is left in the middle is mostly mango seed. Now, place one of the mango cheeks skin side down on the cutting board. Cut long parallel slices through the mango flesh, being careful not to cut through the skin. Rotate the mango cheek about 90 degrees and cut another set of parallel slices perpendicular to the original cuts to form a checkerboard pattern. Repeat the steps with the other mango cheek. Now, finish removing the mango from the skin by choosing the slice and scoop or the inside out method. For the slice and scoop method, take one cheek and insert a spoon along the outer edge where the skin meets the flesh of the fruit. Work the spoon around the edge to scoop out the mango chunks. To perform the inside out method, push the skin up from underneath, flipping the scored mango flesh from the inside to the outside. Use a knife or spoon to scrape the mango chunks off the skin. Easy ways to cut a mango. We can juice and puree fruits. Fresh fruits are really easy, um, basically using a handheld juicer for citrus fruits or pureeing the fruit pulp um, with a blender or a food processor. When it comes to dried fruits, we don't have to actually do anything if we don't want to. We can use uh, those raisins and, uh, and various different dried, uh, dried other products as they are, or if we do want to rehydrate them, we can just pour some uh, hot liquid onto them to help them to rehydrate. Um, now that hot liquid afterwards, you can drain that off and dispose of that, or you may even want to reduce that down to uh, form a part of maybe a syrup or something like that that has a lot of flavor from that dried fruit that you can use as well. When we cook fruits, there's lots of different methods that we can use because we can serve these fruits hot or cold and um, just avoid overcooking when we're cooking the fruits. We want to maintain some structure to them. Remember, we like to have different consistencies, different crunches, different uh, and, and different types of uh, uh, feel, you know, feel in the mouth from these different fruits. So we don't want to have them all just be crushed down, crushed down and pureed up uh, with no texture to them at all. We can grill and broil, we can poach, we can saute, we can bake, we can fry with or without butter, we can microwave, and we can dehydrate as well. Now let's see, what other fruits can we go in? We can take some of these little oranges, these little cuties. So great way to work on these is we want to get the flesh. We don't just want to have juice. We'll take the juice too because that's got lots of flavor. But So we're topping and tailing this as well. And then again, we're going to cut around, making these into a barrel shape. That way we're taking off the pith, the white part especially. That's bitter. We definitely don't want to include that in our fruit roll-up. And we're taking off the skin as well. 
for as little of the flesh as possible. This way we can expose the segments. So citrus, these citrus are all made up of individual segments. So now we can go on one side of that segment, just slice it gently, and then go to the other side of that segment, slice it gently again, and then we can easily just take out that full segment completely intact. We need to work our way all the way around this little cutie, getting all of those out. Once I'm done taking all of these segments out, I'm going to give it a squeeze as well, just to try and get as much juice out of this as I can, after all that flavor. So our first flavor, we're going to actually make some pineapple and some of our oranges. We're going to blend some of those together to make our first flavor fruit roll up. Then after that, we're going to use the other half of the pineapple. And we're going to use, uh, I have a raspberry uh, puree right here, um, that we're going to make into a second batch. The all important thing is here, whichever fruits you want to use, make sure that they are high in pectin. So pectin um, is actually found in lots of citrus fruits. So you can use oranges, limes, lemons, um, and all different types of oranges, grapefruit as well. Um, and then also in pineapples, apples, pears, these all have pectin in them. If you were to just do a berry, just uh, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, they don't have pectin in them. And so they will not set correctly in order to be able to make a nice chewy fruit roll up, which is what we're eventually looking to have. Um, so always make sure you have, if you want to use something like berries, have them blended with a, another fruit that does have that pectin content. But anyway, so we're going to start off, let's fill this up with plenty of our pineapple. And then we're going to add in our oranges for this batch. And all the orange juice is fine as well. I actually hope it's blended. We're going to blend these up and then we're going to start spreading them out. Now we have our pulverized pineapple and oranges that are in here. So now I have this awesome little gadget that I have here as well. So this is a dehydrator. And so we just take this lid off right here. And then I have five other shells that all go down. And what they are, they're made of a grid that allows air movement to occur going straight through them. Um, and then if you see on the top here, this is the top one because it caps everything off. But all the other layers, they all have an actual hole that goes straight through the center uh, that allows the air to pass all the way up, going through the middle. And then when it reaches that top cap, and uh, uh, then actually blows out all the way through just to give even dryness and warmth uh, because we need to make sure that we dry these as quickly as possible so we don't allow bacterial growth. Uh, we'll actually talk about temperatures in a few minutes. Um, but So what we're going to do now is I have some pieces of baking parchment and I'm just going to spread the fruit out on here nice and thinly and place them onto each of the decks of our dehydrator so that way uh, we can then set it up and we can just leave it uh, for the number of hours that it needs to go to fully dehydrate all the fruit. Okay, so now to set this up, we're going to actually do this for five hours. And we're going to do this on 145 degrees. So setting it at 145, that's above the temperature danger zone of 135. So we're safe. So we'll be putting um, the needed heat in there that we're not going to have any bacterial growth um, or any mold growth going on in there. But at the same time, this is not too hot, but it, it will not damage and destroy the vitamin C or the vitamin C content that's in the fruit that we've had, that we placed in here. Our fruit roll-ups here can now be peeled off their back, and we can, we can roll these up, much like fruit roll-ups. We can actually store them. You can then roll them back up in the parts and paper itself. And you can put these into, um, into a Ziploc bag. They will keep for several weeks by like that. Um, 
berry ones with pineapple and berry. When we grill and broil fruits, we want to make sure we cook them quickly. We want to avoid breaking down the structure of the fruit itself. We want to be able to coat them possibly with some honey or sugar. Uh, that actually helps with caramelization um, to emphasize the flavors within that fruit as well. You can cook it on an oiled pan or in, on a broiling platter. When we poach, uh, very famous type of uh, uh, items we poach are pears. And so we're cooking them in a simmering liquid. And we'll look at one of those in just a moment. But we're using uh, this to take the firm fruits to actually soften them up slightly, but to still maintain the shape. Really important. We're not just boiling them to break them down. Um, this is often served as dessert. Some famous ones, peach melba and the pears belle Elaine. Poached pears are really simple to make. You just need to take a saucepan and put in some spices and sugar into it. I've got some cardamom, sugar, light soft brown sugar, cinnamon stick, Madagascan vanilla extract, cloves, star anise, really easy to get hold of these days. Pop that in and some zest of lemon. I'm going to squeeze in some lemon as well and then water. I'm going to bring it to the boil, let it simmer, turn off the heat, leave it to infuse for a little while so that all the flavours work into the syrupy sugary liquid whilst I prepare the pears. For this recipe, I actually like to use these lush pears. They're nice and squat and they have a lovely bulbous shape to them. You want to be able to leave the stalk in place, start peeling from the top of the pear and work around the base. So I take the peeler like that and work it down. And again, and just rotate the pear in your hand and take all of that skin off. When you completely peel the pear, trim off the base, and this makes it easier for the pears to stand up. Now pop them into the syrup and bring that back up to the boil. Simmer for about 20 minutes with the lid on, turning the pears occasionally. The pears have simmered, and I'm just about to take them out of this sugar syrup. You can see how perfect they are. Now, what you want to do is this lovely, lovely syrup, you want to boil that down. I'm going to put that back on the heat. I'm going to boil it for probably 15 minutes or so until it's reduced to a lovely thick syrup. That'd be great because of those pears. Sautéing is where we can be cooking our uh, fruit in butter, sugar and spices. We can make some really rich syrupy flavours with them. So always make sure you peel and core and chop them before you cook them. So that, And make sure you chop them into even sized pieces so that they cook evenly as well. You can make this from many different fruits. So we can make things like fruit sauces, applesauce, fresh berry coulis, compots and coulis. Uh, coulis are, um, are a sauce that's made from pureed fruit. You can serve that hot or cold. And compots um, is where we simmer the fruit in a sugar syrup. And it's, so it's actually, instead of it being pureed, it's uh, it's more lumpy uh, texture to it, um, but it has actual bite to it, and actually, actually pieces in there as well. This can also be served warm or hot uh, or cold as well. Making a fruit sauce. Fruit has a rich, syrupy flavor when cooked in sugar and spices. Fruit can be pureed into a coulis or simmered whole into a compote. Whether a sweet dessert or a savory entree, fruit sauces add excitement to the presentation. To make a basic cherry sauce, start by preparing the flavorful liquid. Add the cherries, brown sugar, vanilla extract, orange juice, nutmeg, and a cinnamon stick into the saucepan. Simmer the cherries over low heat, stirring occasionally until the cherries break down. 
Allow the sauce to reduce in volume according to how thick you want the sauce to be. Finish the sauce by adding any additional spices or flavorings, such as orange zest. Plate and serve with your favorite dish. Making a fruit sauce. Baking is a great method of uh, preparing fruits to change their texture and flavor and to add more things to it as well. Uh, so we can use this especially for firm fruits. It works particularly well. As apples are the most popular baked fruits out there. Now there's two ways to cut these. You can either slice them in half and scoop out some of the apple to make a bowl, or you can use a sharp knife to cut out the core and make a bowl out of the entire apple. Sometimes it also helps if you get a spoon in there and kind of dig it out. You want to go just deep enough that you dig out all of the core and seeds. Then we'll place the apples into a shallow dish. Set those aside for a second and we're going to put together the filling that we're going to then stuff inside. You'll need a third a cup of chopped pecans and mine are pecan halves so I'm just going to chop these up real quick. So we'll scoop in that third a cup of chopped pecans. We're going to stir that together with half a cup of brown sugar and one and a half teaspoons of ground cinnamon. I'll give that a quick mix. Then we'll spoon this into our hollowed out apples. I'm gonna fill it all the way to the top. It's really such a simple filling, but it really is just so delicious and perfect for fall. Next, we'll grab some butter and slice off little half tablespoon slices. Place that half tablespoon of butter on top of each apple filling. Now you don't want these to bake dry. You want to add in some water to create steam, to steam the apples while they bake. So I'm going to pour in about two cups of water into the bottom of the baking dish so that the apples sit in the water. Then we're gonna bake these in a 375 degree oven for 45 minutes or until the apples are soft. Now these are great served up plain while they're still warm, or you can top it with a scoop of vanilla ice cream, maybe a drizzle of caramel syrup. But these are an amazing fall treat, no matter how you end up serving them. Microwaving is also a possibility as well. Just remember, when you're microwaving though, you're not gonna get any browning going on with that fruit because it's literally just going to steam its own juices um, as it only heats up the water content of the fruit. Uh, just be very careful. You can overcook things very, very quickly and you can get some uneven cooking going on there as well. Uh, so cover them, and uh, but leave it open to actually allow any escaping steam to get out and make sure you puncture some holes or make some score marks in the fruit's skin to make sure they don't explode. Never a good thing. Fruit plates and fruit salads are extremely popular. Get lots of different flavor profiles all coming in together. You can serve them with things like uh, cottage cheese and yogurt as well, or even a sorbet. They're very, very versatile. Fruit is also amazing for using as garnishes for desserts, as we can see um, on our pictures here and on entrees too. You generally don't have to do an awful lot with fruit to make it look pretty. Very often just washing it, drying it, and placing it right on top of your dessert or on your entree. Hey Pam, get away from my new flower! What? I don't smell anything. <laughs> Whoa! Happy April Fool's Day! <laughs> Excuse me guys, you better watch it! I think you mean wash it. <laughs> <laughs> Fruit is so versatile in our culinary world, we use it everywhere. So learn all about it. Learn what you like, learn what you don't like, and see if there's something you can do to make it where it's more appropriate for what you enjoy. But fruit can be used everywhere. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned some things, and I look forward to seeing you in the kitchen. Cheers.